Hello, and welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts online series at home, Artists in Conversation. I'm Indy Chaudhry, postgraduate associate in the research department at the center. I'm delighted to welcome John Acumfra and Trevor Matheson to our program today. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Please note that this program will be recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout the program. We will be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather your questions for John and Trevor, and they'll be answered at the end of the program. But please do feel free to submit questions at any time throughout. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous people and nations, including Mohican, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skatico, Golden Hill Pocasset, Niantic, and Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin-speaking people have stewarded through generations the land and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and this land. John Acumfra is an artist, filmmaker, and director who explores themes such as memory, temporality, and the experiences of global migrant communities. Trevor Matheson is an artist, composer, sound designer, and recordist whose haunting and poetic audio work has been featured in over 30 award-winning films. John and Trevor were founding members of the seminal Black Audio Film Collective that was active between 1982 and 1998, a group of seven artists whose wide-ranging body of films engaged with Black and other diasporic cultures in Britain. John and Trevor were pivotal to the collective signature style that is characterized by dense, richly textured and layered works that are both visually and orally arresting. As part of Black Audio, John and Trevor collaborated on Hansworth Songs from 1986, a groundbreaking film essay examining the race riots of 1985 in Birmingham and London. After 1998, the two artists have continued to collaborate along with Black Audio members, Lena Gopur and David Lawson, on other award-winning films, such as The Nine Muses, Parapetea, Vertigo C, and most recently, John and Trevor have worked with the artist Dred Scott on Slave Rebellion reenactment from 2019. Trevor has also founded and practices in several other experimental sonic groups, including Dub Morphology, Hallucinator, and Flow Motion. John was appointed Officer of the Order of the British Empire, OBE, in 2008. He received the European Cultural Foundation's Princess Margaret Award in 2012. And in 2017, he won the UK's Biennial Arts Munde Prize and appointed Commander of the Order of the British Empire, CPE. Both artists have exhibited in museums and galleries worldwide. John's most recent exhibition, the Unintended Beauty of Disaster, comprising of video installations and photo text works, is currently showing at the Listen Gallery in the UK until the end of July. Together and individually, their work remains at the forefront of discussions about race and migration, while continuing to explore the visual and sonic possibilities of film and lens-based works. The artists live and work in London from where they join us today. It is my immense pleasure and privilege to be able to speak to you both. The work I'd like to begin our conversation with is the one on our current online exhibition, Newman, from 2014. May we show excerpt one, please? Everything as it once had been, save faded and weathered. Where the shape of a city stood in the grayness like a charcoal drawing, sketched across the waste. Nothing to see. No smoke. It was very cold. And after a while, the rain stopped. John, I'm going to quote yourself back to you from an email 
that you sent to me when I first asked you about having a human in our exhibition. You described to me, quote, this is a post-apocalyptic story about surviving disaster with a prophetically eerie connection to the pandemic. May I ask you about this interest in global ecologies, disaster, and especially survival, that is especially conversant with the pandemic that we've seen in your other trilogies, such as Vertigo C, Purple, and Four Nocturnes. Thank you so much for arranging this. It's, it's, I mean, you know, we have, Trevor and I haven't seen you forever, but <laughs> you're still very close to our hearts. So thank you for returning the uh, compliment and the favour. I'd like to just take a little bit of that time to speak a tiny bit about Trevor because we very rarely get to do this. And so because of that, maybe people think that we're somehow continents apart or something. <laughs> we live about 30 minutes from each other and we've done so for close to 40 years. You know? In fact, you know, this is the furthest we've lived away because we were, we, between 82 and 85, lived in the same flat, making the neighbours lives hell because all the sonic, sonic constructions were made in this flat in King's Cross, which is a terrible place to be at the time, well, terrible to be next to us anyway, at the time. So we've always been close. We were certainly the first two who met in the cluster of individuals that became Black Audio, you know? That's kind of, without my meeting show, I'm not sure that anything else would have happened really, because we were sort of the bridge for the two camps, the, the kind of art camp and the humanities camp to walk across to meet each other. And I think the reason I want to say that is because the practice that's evolved between us is pretty much what Newman embodies, really, because we had been commissioned to make something for the British Art Show. I'd been commissioned, I said I wouldn't do it without working with Trevor because it was low budget, so we had to do everything ourselves. We had to shoot, edit, do the whole thing, just the two of us. So basically what happened then is usually what happened with all the films, you know, uh, all the projects, whether they're installations, films, documentaries. You know. We make mini versions of them. And either they get used or we're not happy with them and we discard them. Newman was one that we made when we thought that our contribution to the British Art Show would be characterized by a sense of the apocalyptic. And then we kind of lost, <laughs> we, we lost faith in that idea because it seemed too, too dark. I mean, you know, who would have thought, eh? 2014, apocalypse was too dark. Wow. So we basically completed it and put it aside and thought, all right, what else can we take from this to make something else? And that's pretty much what we did. We sort of took the sense of a sort of a past defined by a set of unintelligible trauma and used that as the basis for what we finally entered for the exhibition, which was a piece called All That Is Solid. And the trauma and pandemic in question there was to do with migration and the, the infection of misremembering and forgetting. But uh, Newman continues to be quite close to our hearts, <laughs> which is why well, we've allowed you to show it. Normally we don't. I mean, there's a lot of, almost all the films have rehearsals almost which you could probably call this and they normally get buried quite deep in the vaults of either smoking dogs or black holes but this one i thought had promise and that's why that one was good to show sorry to go on but you know in terms of the connections that you're talking about i mean that also then tells you just how central the collaboration with trevor is because everything that you've mentioned the trilogies he worked on <laughs> you know so do you want to chip in anything, Trevor, or are you just going to sit there looking for Yeah, I was, I was just loving this. This is so good. My ego is now sort of... No, but no, the thing is, as much as all of what we do, we're always, always collecting material. So like you said, we filmed in the park nearby me, but it's also that the weather was quite weird, quite emotional, like it's very foggy for a couple of days, and that seemed to sort of motivate us to get out to shoot and to record and then 
the monuments around the city became like um, frozen skeletons that marked out space. So there's lots of little things that seem to start to um, piece together. So the raw elements that was actually laid out that was organizing into Newman. It again starts off by the weather being a marker, being so dramatic that it would be useful to just capture these events. And so that's what happen. So you've mentioned. That, sorry, Joe. Sorry, I, I was just going to say I'd forgotten that element. And in a way, that's the connective tissue that links up all these projects because half the time they are in part responses to other sudden eruptions of newness or ongoing sort of um, disputes which will reach a peak a crescendo and then, then you think okay maybe we should do something <laughs> you know so Trevor just there was this fog which just was extraordinary and it seemed to go on for for days and he just started filming it I mean without necessarily having any idea that this might be a project and that's kind of how almost all of our projects start in a way they've got tangents to spaces outside of the commissioned zone. But by the time you get to a commission, there's already something that you're kind of trying to make sense of or, or deal with. So well, it, with the, the, the element of sort of, because you're collecting all the time, you're sort of familiar with the material. And then you can say, okay, this could work for this. But that's at the point when you start to organize or making the making product about at the early stage or very beginning stage is actually does this interest you? There's something interesting about this frame or the environment. And that's what I meant by the sculptures being like frozen, sort of skeletal, because they're marking time. And at each time you come to it, you can sort of tease out another kind of position or an argument for it all. There's sort and of that, like silent witnesses over the city. Constantly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, no, I was just going to say this idea of frozen skeletons and monuments and the tangents of the weather and the monuments. I wanted to ask you both, but maybe I could start with you, Trevor, is that's a kind of recurring motif in your work, this sort of from Signs of Empire in 83 to most recently in John's kind of Our Skin is Our Monument. It's currently on at the list. And so could I ask you to talk more about the sort of frozen skeletons and silent witnesses that we see? Yeah, again, being in this city, there are a lot of them around and you know they were either acknowledging great victories or great heroes or figures of note but again it's, it's trying to tease out a conversation that they may not be willing to offer up in spite of themselves there's a way that we can tease get something out of, out of them or place them in, into the, the position that argues our right to actually engage with the people so that's what that, for me is what we're doing with it. The Albert Memorial is a classic sort of four cornered piece on empire. It gives you the four continents with their ideals of all of these nations. It's idealized, but yet at the top of it is this golden prince surrounded by the, the cherubs and the angels and other great figures. So like a it's literal story. No, no, I was just going to provide a tiny bit of context. I was talking about the Albert Memorial, which is Queen Victoria's kind of gift to the nation in honour of her, her dead husband, uh, Prince Albert. And it's been a very defining work for our work, you know, I think we've gone to it so many times now that it feels like a kind of lost relative almost every time you revisit it. It was certainly the basis for Signs of Empire from 82 to 84. And Trevor and I revisited it. He reshot it again for me for the new Listen show. Now, I mean, I think a lot of what Trevor's saying there is absolutely why we do it, because there's a sort of inhospitality of the monument that says, you know, I'm here. Do you mind just going away? Because I'm here. My job is to be permanent, to fix time and all that rest of it. And, and you have to, especially if you have an interest in bricolage and assemblage and construction and all these motifs that run through the work, you have to then be able to say to the piece, well, yes, that's what you say. Yeah. 
but I, we want to offer you a much more hospitable exchange, if you will. You know, would like to offer you a dialogue in which you agree to participate in your fullness. So this isn't dismantling. This is accepting the premise of the monument that it has something of value. But to then remain circumspect, to remain skeptical about the grandness of those claims. And it's in that process of willing a dialogue between our skepticism and its hubris that something else happens. And it's always different because every time the monument speaks to you, it's in a different context. The narratives that are propping it up or trying to pull it down are different. And so that's why it continues to hold these fascinations. You know, as you know, the monument is suddenly back in conversation <laughs> okay, as embodiments of historicity. And so suddenly again, questioning those claims, reasserting their mythic dimensions, trying to suggest that they might both sometimes be custodians as well as banishers of history was all worth trying to say again in a new setting, in a new scene, which is the present. Great. And uh, there's another one in that still that you're just looking at. <laughs> so yeah, we are clearly fascinated by the monument. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Could we have the second excerpt, please? So this is from Hansworth Songs, 1986, widely regarded as the seminal work of the Black Audio. Trevor, the overlying sound we can hear is of whale song. So please may I ask you the impetus and the choice for this sort of sound. I'm especially interested, sort of as well as the use of filmic montage that the collective is well known for through excavating kind of archival material, newsreel and stills, and how this is supported by your sort of sonic montage. And if you could explain to us both the choice of this and how this works in the film. Well, the first part is when I saw the clip, it felt like this guy was being answered. That was my first sort of reaction. And then this other thing, the sound was a part of the idea of like whalers hunting this noble creature. And it just felt right that it just felt Mixture with the other sort of percussive sort of sounds and the tone of the world song. There's a sort of um, sadness and longing. That's the sort of thing that was going on in there. A motive, I guess, if you go know, It just felt like this guy was being hunted by these people. And that's one of the things I was thinking. That's very interesting. You know, the um, way you kind of need to understand the space in which this is being created because I think it helps to make sense of the piece in, in some ways as well. So the studio that Black Audio had in the early 80s was kind of about 1,500 square feet. I don't know how much that is in meters. And one corner of it had an editing room, but with a glass window that looked into Trevor's sound studio, right? So they were very, very close to each other. I mean, we tried to have sound paneling, but it didn't, it didn't really do any good. So the net result was either he was disturbing the editing or the editing was disturbing him. And in a kind of weird form of osmosis, this relentlessly provisional interest in piecemeal 
became an aesthetic strategy. So Trevor clearly had an interest in the songs of the humpback world. We had the album, I think, in, you know, yeah. he had the album in Portsmouth in the early 80s. So, so he's been listening to this stuff for a while. You know, much of the percussive clangs we had recorded a year before that, you know, or maybe even two years before that, during the making of Signs of Empire. So what feels even now like a kind of whole piece is actually an assemblage of elements which were themselves in response to the conditions. You know, so he can see the cut, he can see the edit literally being constructed from where he is. You know, he's like feet away from it. And this is unusual because normally sound design really doesn't have that proximity to montage. The two happen spatially, you know, certainly temporarily, miles apart. And this was one of the reasons why we wanted to set up a collective and have a workshop, so that these proximities can turn accidentals and provisional and fragmentary insights and motivations into permanent working motifs for things. So thank God it worked. I mean, you know, of his, you still need the insight as he's just given you about what would work and what, what it is, if you will, the emotive quality that one wanted to convey with a particular scene. You still need that in order to get the shit working, as they say. <laughs> but the question of the proximity to the ongoing edit, the sort of overlap of spaces, if you will, between the two worlds, I think helped enormously. In many ways, we never really, I think we had one more project like that, you know, possibly maybe two. We never really got that sense of proximity with the different agents working on the projects again, you know, things just got too busy, didn't they, really? We had to go off and do stuff. So we never really got the, the kind of hub, the energy and the insights that came out of being literally cheek by jowl with each other. But the tape slide had that though. That yeah. Again, the tape slide, when we was building the tape slide, we had the big, long um, tailors and dressmakers table. So we was able to have a, like a production line and constructing yeah. the slide. And then on making the soundtrack, we was able to make, uh, record elements on different cassettes and play those back and sort of stack the sound. Then we was able to get into the studio and actually lay the tracks out onto like an eight track recorder and then we was able to mix it for like I suppose basically an hour long track basically. So we were able to do that twice by taking the elements and reconstructing them and doing it a parallel line sort of thing. But it's, it's easy it's basically I was gonna say is it was good to be next door to the edit because you always know when it weren't working. Because the next morning if it wasn't there you knew that piece of music weren't going to be seen ever again. So the turnaround was quite quick to sort of like, if it's still in, you heard it. If it weren't in, it was gone. So you have to come up with something else. So that was quite... I like that, man. It wasn't that brutal. <laughs> it was. <but laughs> lunchtime, you go in thinking happiness and you come back after lunch and it's like, no, we, you know. And I'll tell you what, one of the things which was really interesting about that period as well was the lengths to which you had to go to to fulfill certain kind of sonic criteria, if you would. Trevor was obsessed with loops. I don't know where, whether it's on Burroughs or Brion Geisen or Cabaret Volta, I don't know quite where it came from, but the obsession with loops was a sort of, and most of these loops, some of which you can hear in this track actually, were like physically constructed and played sometimes at the same time. We didn't have enough multi, um, real to real recorders. So every time we had to do one of these all night sessions, we run around to other arts organizations, begging people to loan their real to real recorders so that we can set up. And it, it wouldn't be unusual to have 10, 12, sometimes four or five real to real recorders, all with different loops going. <laughs> with Trevor at the center of it going, oh, hold that one, today, slow that down. <laughs> it was crazy. But, you know, the, it gave you a kind of immediacy that you feel in that track there. Do you know what I mean? You really feel that sense of alchemy being brought to play by sonic elements that clearly had very little to do with each other, except 
in that moment of the construction. That's also, the, like you said before, that's where the alchemy really comes together, where you take two disparate elements and you bring them together and somehow they create a third textual oh, yes. response and that moves the argument forward again. So it, it's a constant finding different combinations of things that seem to lock in. And again, it is that sort of, not like an hierarchy, but there's a certain signals that you can play and you hear the different sort of dynamics as you listen through the sound again. So that's also the exciting thing. That also comes out of varying signals within the, the cycle of the loop or the different frequencies. You can start hearing different sort of um, sonic patterns or tonal shifts that you can actually make use of or take advantage of and actually deploy and piece in the end. That was the magic of playing around with the tapes, I think. When it starts to break down, you start to hear the earlier recording or fragments of it being played back. But then you hear it again, so you're getting like a different sort of echo or call and response kind of thing going on. But as you embed that, you start to have like a thick stew-like sound. You start having distinct elements that you can pull out again. When you offer it up against the image, the whole frigging thing seems to come together. That's I mean, at the center of, of the thing really was a nucleus of people really, really interested in noise. Not music, not sound, but noise. And different versions of noise. You had Edward George, who was absolutely steeped in dub. I mean, I think he lived in record shops at the time. And Trevor was almost certainly really interested in, in dub but equally interested in the sort of post-punk emergent groups, whether it's Cabaret Voltaire, Throbin Gristle, or you know, any of that lot. I liked both sides, but my thing was free jazz. I had a kind of a real affinity with some of the early exponents of free jazz, be it Ayla or the Lake of Train, you know, so, and it was that sort of palette of musical taste, if you will, that, that was brought together. So the challenge always was that anything that sounded too ordinary, somebody was bound to say, well, no. <laughs> either on the basis of the interest in dub or post-punk or, you know, free jazz, you know, somebody was, you know, you were always pushing each other to just try and force the question of the sonic into a slightly different register to the normative or the normal. And that push, that sense of collective egging each other on, I think made the projects acquire a kind of special aura and ambience that people now talk about, you know, the poetic, the lucid, all of that is really because at the center of it were groups of people with Catholic interests in noise. Really. You've both answered my questions, both about the relationship between the tape slide and the tape loop and about the significance of black audio and having audio in there, you've answered that beautifully. So I'm just going to ask for the third excerpt, please. The Mothership Connection, it's kind of George Clinton's obvious, uh, it's his 1974 album in which uh, you have uh, an alien, you have George Clinton who's like an alien in kind of silver foil and he's kind of getting out of a spaceship. You can't work out whether he's getting out of the spaceship or getting back into the spaceship. By this time, Black music had, black itself had become commercial. You know, it was hip to be black, you know, music, you know, the dance bands of James Brown and uh, all of that. So, and hip hop, I mean, rock and roll had just like faded out, you know, in 69. So it was time to make a change. This figure is a thief. He's a data thief. And he's surfing across the internet of black culture breaking into the vaults, breaking into the rooms, and stealing fragments. Fragments from cyber culture, techno culture, narrative culture. So John, there's a sense of presence in all your work, a kind of foretelling and looking back at the same time, whether it's a kind of historical dislocation or a temporal one. And in this work, The Last Angel of History from 1996, there's both a nod to Benjamin and rather than describing Afrofuturism, it portrays it, especially through the figure of the data thief who can travel through space and time. 
So could I ask you to talk about your interests in time more generally, but also in this work to Afrofuturism? Uh, we don't literally have the time for that. <laughs> So I'll pick a strand of it and run with it, if you don't mind, because okay, it will be here to, to tomorrow if I try to answer that question. I mean, I think what interests me, I mean, look at Kojo Eshen, he's so young, it's incredible. <laughs> what interests me now more and more about Last Angel is, is the time itself of its making and the strange convergence and coming together of interests and themes. You know? It starts this process that I'm still really, really fond of, which is to try and always cast one of us in the role of a figure, a central figure. And in this case, the data thief, as you can see, is Edward George, because he quite literally became the embodiment of this figure. Eddie and Floyd Webb from Chicago had done like almost a year and a half were for research, I mean, like really detailed research into all the different possible tangents of what would become Afrofuturism, whether it's Egyptian cosmology or, you know, Malian epistemologies or, I mean, just everything. And it got closer and closer and closer to, to when we had to do this thing. And I was still struggling for a form for it, kind of a, a way by which we could deliver all this myriad Info. And, and it really wasn't until we arrived in the Mojave, standing there with Edward, that I thought, actually, no, you do it. <laughs> you just stand there and tell us, because you know everything. <laughs> you be the, the thief. But that would not have been possible had we not started talking to Pervez Khan, who made many of the um, animations here for me. And he had started way before. Trevor had started working on possible music pieces, you know, like way before. And so it was a time when it was possible to trust in the provisional. There was no such phrase as Afrofuturism then. It wasn't fit, but we knew what it was. We knew that there would be a time when it will be a term. And this was trying to make a project that might hasten the time, the arrival of the term. And so everyone knew that they were working with a set of provisional agendas about what was possible, that it was only really ever going to come together when we all delivered what we were supposed to do. And I'm interested in that sort of open-endedness of time or the ways in which practice, audiovisual practice, cultural practice, can enter into this negotiation of time in order to render it open-ended so that we can zip across 3,000 years of African history without having to do it in the usual disrespectful, oh, this is Egypt and this is, you know, you don't have to do that. The whole point is to derive and devise a practice that allows you to intervene strategically along different timelines, bending them to your will in the present. That's what interests me about making these projects, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, Trevor. So John's been talking about the compositions for this piece and a really interesting choice, and perhaps rather unexpected, is the soundtrack for this film is all your own compositions. So could you explain the rationale behind sort of the sound for this particular film? In a way, it's not to try and replicate what was already in the film, as in the other musicians that we've represented in the film. So this was like the, the gas or the, the air that time traveller, the data thief, is carried with them. This is their sonic baggage that follows them through these interventions or these journeys and collections. So that's what I guess was trying to evoke this sort of um, electronic or atonal kind of sound, I guess. So it's a very, again, like John said, there's lots of things, look elements that have been made before and tried to be massaged back into position or new positions or new relationships between what's been cut, like the the information is uploaded onto the screen as a sort of mechanical understand. So they elements that came from other things and either sped up and slowed down and reconstituted it. Mm -hmm. I had a very open brief on it, more or less, but the clear thing was don't try and compete with what these other dudes are doing. That also was a liberating sort of thing to sort of try and find 
a sonic glue that can actually bind these things together, but still leave enough space for them, the music to stand and represent. So that's the sort of thing. I mean, we don't, I think this is really important to get across. We don't work in the traditional way in which image and sound is brought together in most movement image time-based work. Generally, there's a kind of hierarchy and there's also a sort of timeline in which the, the production of the image has very distinct durational properties. It happens first and then there's a kind of supplement, which is the addition of the sound. We've never worked like that. One of the open-ended briefs, remit, was, I mean, Trevor was there full time. So he's generating stuff full time in advance and ahead of things. So sometimes the images themselves were, or what we were coming up with, were in response to what you're hearing him grappling with you know, questions he was trying to raise about chance and assemblage and seriality and, you know, sonic narratives, you know, so you're hearing all this and you're also then trying to think, okay, well, what can be the equivalent of that? So there's very much a kind of back and forth in many of the projects. And Last Entry was no exception. So that, I mean, I think very, very many pieces probably came, I can't remember now offhand, but very many pieces that I ended up trying with Trevor probably came before. So they, in fact, anticipated the images. It's not always the other way around. We don't have a, the workerist model. <laughs> we go from the cutting room to the sound stage. You know, Listen, my good man, we would like some sounds for this image. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't always work like that. It has occasionally when we just had to say, look, mate, <laughs> <laughs> we've got to have this because otherwise it's not going to work. But generally, and especially, I mean, almost wholly throughout the Black Audio period, there was very much a, a sort of porous border, if you like, between the two states with multiple crossings of it before any project was completed. Also, when we're filming, so we're collecting stuff as we're going along anyway. So like if we're interviewing somebody, I'm always collecting the ambient sound of the space. So you know you're going to need it in the edit. That may actually be a starting point for a piece of sound as well. The sound of the washing machine or the, the fridge may actually sometimes be a particular beginning or possible beginning as a tunnel sheet within other stuff. So we're always, when we're filming, we're always collecting sound as we're going along as well. So on the off chance, it would be useful or could be in, incorporated into a piece of work, either for then or further down the line again. So it's taken a full advantage of the opportunity of the location and the conditions that we're in. Because there's sometimes some weird stuff that comes along. One of the places was in, I think, Japan, and you could hear the cicadas. And it was the first time I heard these things sort of sounding like electronic signals that's coming out of the, these bushes. And, and that became well, another starting piece of an old point, which was looped and played back. But it's those sort of things, like sometimes there's a um, one, when he's in Ghana, we heard some drumming. He was on in the compound that we were staying in. You could hear these drumming down in the village. So he got up on the roof of the apartment and done like a stereo recording of this distant sound. It was like an up sticky evening, but this sound was so rich. So you could hear the drumming, but you could hear like the, the chickens and the other, dog, you know, other sounds intermingling with this sort of percussive track and the laughter and everything. So based on the same, there's taking a full advantage of the situation which may be incorporated back into that film or future projects again. So that's one of the things again. That's collecting stuff. That's really interesting. Could we go to the next excerpt, please? Final one. So John, we sort of come full circle, really. We've come like this sort of idea of like fabulation and the historical merging in, in the clip we've just seen, Peripatea from 2012. Your source material was from two Jura sketches, 
thought to be the earliest depictions of black people in Western art, one ahead of a black male and the other a portrait of a Moorish woman, Katerina. And I just wanted to ask you about both this idea of a kind of a fictive world and the historical merging, disrupting the archive, but also this idea of a kind of ontological becoming, which seems to sort of run through this work. I mean, um, I'm still pissed you didn't use the opening, so I could just have a laugh at Trevor looking cold. <laughs> that would have been really nice. I, I think the audience would have enjoyed it too. <laughs> Watching Trevor freezes, quote unquote, bollocks. I have to say, Trevor chose this piece, so yeah. Of course he would. <laughs> of course he would. Well, I mean, as you could see, that's him, Trevor Matheson, in his other role as actor in <laughs> John O'Comfort installations. We did quite a few together in the end and continue to. And I think that fiction or what you're calling the fictive element is absolutely central. It's central to how we approach the archival and it's central to how one envisages a project built around multiple ontologies. All we had at the beginning of this were two prints. I had photographs, but they, they started off as drawings. Two drawings by Albrecht Dürer, German painter, both from the 16th century. And you're right, both seen as one of the earliest figurative pieces of uh, the Black and Western painting. But that's not enough. It's not enough for a project, but it's also not enough for life because all the references go to the white European painter who had given birth to these pieces. So the act of bringing them alive requires that you step outside of the facticity of the archive in order to build a world in which the facticity of the archive can make sense to build a world in which these two drawings can reconvene with the real and become alive without recourse to Albrecht Dürer. And that's always the challenge that we face with the archive. There is no moment in which when you encounter the archival, it is complete, full, whole, alive. No, it never happens. It's always a kind of fragment, a deposit, a facsimile of a ruin, et cetera, et cetera. And our duty, both in the ethical and the aesthetic sense, is to make lives possible. Not to deify the origin of the archive or the originator, but to make lives possible, to bring forth possible ontologies, that come directly out of these fragments. And so you're forced, because of that, ethically and aesthetically, to recourse to the fictive. In the fictive, one has the possibility of a re-inscription. And it's not so much a lie, but it is a fiction, because it's not, <laughs> it's not based on anything. You know, Trevor doesn't look like anybody, as far as I know, from the 16th century. <laughs> It did for me, and that's enough. And in the process of doing that, something really magical always happens. You know, listen, I'm a documentarist at heart. I love the veracity of the archive. But, I mean, I'm not a romantic about the archive. We are people of African origin. We don't have some history hidden in a vault that's clean and waiting and all we need to do is just find a vault open it, and then yet it all come out. No, we don't have that. We don't have either the luxury of the illusion of that, but we also don't have the fact of, of the illusion of that. It just, we just don't have it. And so we have had to, because we don't have it, one of the options thrown up by defenders of whiteness is to say, well, look, you know, it's not there, therefore, you didn't have it. <laughs> you know? It becomes an apology for omission. It's not there, so 
you know, well, what can we do? If you were there, if you were clever, if you were intelligent, you'd have a civilization, and then there'll be a history, and then there'll be a past, and we can just go over it, refer to it. But clearly, you don't have any archives, so it means you didn't have it. And ours is to refuse the shadow of that bad faith. It's our job to not accept the fait accompli of that bad faith and to question that. And so that's what I was trying to do and have tried to do in many projects like Peripatia. So I'm going to now turn to the Q&A. Thank you. I mean, that was a really rich sort of question. I'm going to sort of bag some up together. So we've got a couple on Peripatia. So we have one, Peripatia is a masterpiece. How do other forms of art, like the Dura images, make their way into your films? I'll hand this over to John. With great difficulty. (laughs) Partly because I don't always decide things myself. Sometimes things decide you. And the moment when you see something and when it becomes a possibility for you to talk to it in a project are sometimes years apart. So the Dura images we saw together in 87, 88, because we were trying to do a project then on Black British settlement, starting with the kind of the Afro-Roman armies, you know, to the present. And so we bought all this stuff and research and then I came across them and I was like, whoa, okay, I know we want to do this, but this is like absolutely remarkable because there's something, I mean, if you don't know the drawings, I urge you to look at them again because they are so rich in, in so many things. So clearly, yes, there has to be something compelling about the piece to draw you in in the first place. But that's not a foregone conclusion. There's no logical and necessary correspondence between deciding that something is good and then making a piece about it. That took a while because sometimes you just have to wait for the works themselves to, you know, and I mean that with all this mumbo jumbo, (laughs) you know, they're, they're not always necessarily congenial hosts or guests, these works. They ask questions that you can't answer sometimes. They formulate questions that are to trick you or they make demands that you can't meet. You know, I want a film about me. That's like a Hollywood epic. Well, I don't have the money for that. (laughs) Can I do this with you? No, I deserve and Hollywood, you know. So you go through several kind of conversations with them before you arrive at something that seems to work. In this case, it took almost 20 years of talking to them. So Trevor, it was cold, wasn't it? We, it was really cold, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Go on, tell him. <laughs> no, it was interesting because of the. It was cold. Good. <laughs> I just wanted you to admit that. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 every time I see that image, I, I remember how cold it was. Well, actually, Trevor, we do have a question okay. <laughs> about you being in front of the camera and that collaborative, and how was John able to persuade you to take on that role? and what it meant as part of your collaborative practice to work together in that way. He was going to leave me on the mountainside unless I got dressed up. I didn't have any tickets to get home. There's only one way down the mountain, so I had to, so I had to do it. No, it's, it, it, it started from the tape slide. There's uh, John and, and Lena's hands in the tape slide, first tape slide. There's my aunt and arm in a Andrew's song sort of fan in. So we've always we've used ourselves in parts or fragments of ourselves in pieces because um, nobody else was around at the time to sort of to step up and do it. But I always do the open safety check on certain bits. When they say, well, look a bit further, we want to get a shot of you. I think, no, because it's mine and I'm not going... I'm always afraid. afraid. Can't get him to do anything daring. No, <laughs> There's gators in the water. I'm not going any further than this. You've got a lens on there. You can zoom in. That's it. I mean, without, without Trevor's kind of actually presence, and David Lawson, to be honest, yeah. my muses wouldn't be the project that it turned out to be, you know, because almost all the sequences with the yellow jacket is Trevor Maxson, almost every single one of them. Whose and, jacket was that one? Or, or mine. Yeah, it's the best jacket. He had the I best <laughs> It wasn't, I've never worn it outside of, I mean, this is part of the problem with 
putting your own clothes into a film, you never wear them again. I have never actually worn that jacket. It's outside. never been that cold, though, is it? It's never been like that, really. No. Really? No. But you don't wear them anymore. You wear your black one. I yeah. don't wear that yellow one anymore because you know every time I put it on, I look like a figure from the Nine Muses. <laughs> so I take it off again. I think the audience can now see what a conversation is like between the three of us. Yeah. Often, you know, I have to say that I'm thankful that the teasing is not yet been directed to me. But I have <laughs> a very serious question from Alex Yalo. Can you speak through the power of multi-channel moving image for your, vision, for your vision? Thinking specifically about the work on Stuart Hall and the multiple images projected at once, for example, to amplify his legacy. Hmm. Can you speak through a multi-channel piece? Yeah. Um, I think so. I mean, but more importantly, I always hope so. I mean, you know, none of the forms through which we arrive at any of these projects, whether it's high definition digital video, single screen, or TV monitors with three or four screen, six channel, you know, it, none of them are automatically the things that suggest themselves at the beginning of the project. I try to be open to the possibility of alternatives more and more if I can. The one mode of address that I'm less and less enamored with is the single screen one because multi-screen works are increasingly offering me the ability to speak across a range of concerns simultaneously and to deprioritize, deprogram the question of human agency in most of these works now. Look, I'm no kind of anti-humanist or anything, but the fact is that if you take a famine or a drought, you would routinely come across reportings of it, which operate on the basis that this is a kind of single species phenomenon, right? So either human beings are dying or elephants are dying. But, you know, droughts are kind of equal of disasters. <laughs> <laughs> they wipe out just about everybody in that space. And so there is a moral imperative, there's an aesthetic imperative, if you will, to some of these aesthetic choices because they allow a much more open-ended conversation between elements which share them in the first place. I'm not forcing things to talk to each other when they already have those intimacies anyway. But there's also moments when you have to force those intimacies because it's important for things to converse. It's important for a program or a project on the history of whaling and the slaughter of humpback whales in the millions to talk to a project about the history of the transatlantic trade. Not because black people are whales, but because the technologies that made one possible license the other. So they have a kind of hidden symbiosis. They have a, a connection that one makes explicit by having them talk to each other, you know? And it's not a reductionist project. We're not trying to say that one is equal to the other, or, heaven forbid, you know, of course not. But where there are intimacies, where there are proximities, where there are elective affinities, however indirect those are, it feels to me always best now to make projects that allude to that. And I'm much more interested in that now. It's not by any means the exclusive, but increasingly more and more so, yeah. I hope that answers the question. It does, it was fantastic. I have a lot of messages of gratitude coming in for the whole canon of your work. But as we're running a little bit over time, I'm going to sort of finish and maybe just wrap up a couple of questions in one. So there's a lot of questions to both of you about the distinctions between noise, sound and music and how you see them feeding into your work. And in tandem with that, to maybe talk about a wider legacy of the black radical tradition that comes out of a sonic vision 
through black or geo that's very different maybe from what we have here in the US. So maybe if I take that little part between noise, sound and music and ask you, Trevor, about those distinctions and whether you see those distinctions. Well, music is usually made by humans or organised people do that. Sound is what we have around us all the time. Noise is a distinct sound of your fan eater or the, um, your fridge or the sort of um that you get from a light bulb. So there's distinct things that you find in one. So the skill is to how you organise each of those elements to actually be a poetic or a tonal scheme or organise it in such a way that you find it useful. So you can take each of those things and make them, you can take noise and turn that into music or you can, you can interpret that into music because it just depends what, what's the instrument that's actually making the sound and how you organise those things. So um, for me, I'll I take all of those elements and I'll try to massage them or conjole them into a soundscape that I find interesting or whoever the client finds it or useful. So all of those elements I, I would take into it. Thank you. And John, if I could ask you to maybe talk about the vision of Black Audio as part of this either a global Black radical tradition or one that's kind of synonymous with the Black British identity, as you see. It. We were always aware of, defined by, in some many, many cases, in conversations with something that one could call a Black radical tradition. And that tradition for me has several tentacles, you know, rooted in different geographies, different practices, art forms, eschatologies, philosophies, epistemologies, but we were aware of the range, right? So it wasn't uncommon to have a conversation in which, you know, Thelonious Monk would crop up whilst you were talking about CLR James, who might then have something to tell you about Wilson Harris, who could tell you something about Ramara Burden's collage. There was a sense that whether it's the work of Cedric Robinson, what became Cedric Robinson's later, or the continuation of James's Marxist project with Nkrumah to basically kickstart the Pan-African political movement in, Ghana and so you know, you were aware that there were these tentacles that defined the African diaspora. And that as products of that, you needed to be aware of that. Now, I mean, the most difficult conversations that we had with others who weren't was what the relationship should be between the practice and this tradition. Very many cases, people simply saw it as a direct mirroring. There's this tradition, you're there, just mirror it. You know? <laughs> Make films about C.L.R. James or he's thinking, you know. And having to persuade sometimes gently, sometimes aggressively, sometimes polemically, that there exists a space of autonomy for cultural practice. And the practice that we were involved in in particular was really important. Partly because, look, Trevor and I, unlike you, and you know, we were part of that group of kids who came of age in England for the first time in a post-war period. There hadn't been anybody like us before us as a group, right? So as an emergent Black British group, you had to find out ways in which you can name this Black Britishness in its myriad forms, aesthetically, politically, you know, all of that. And you're not helped by people telling you, well, actually the answer is already there. All you've got to do is read C.L.R. James and figure out how to make a film about C.L.R. James. No, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is we are not C.L.R. James. We like C.L.R. James, but we are not. You know, we're growing up here and we have to deal with shit here. So it was very important to be aware of the tradition. Without it, much of our, reflexes, gestures, wouldn't have been what they were. But trying to find the correct distance from it was also important. Because each generation will grow into this, that space for themselves. Each time it's a different, so iteration again, slightly different tone, slightly different 
sort of yeah. emphasis. So every group has their own sort of moment of becoming again, and they all are relevant to a thing that we may not notice. But it doesn't take away from the overall arc that we're all going through, basically. There's that famous funnel piece in there. Quote, isn't there? That each generation has to find its mission, deliver it, or disappear in relative opacity. <laughs> Gleason might say that the disappearance of the opacity might not be a bad thing, but you know, I think we were very aware of that. We were very aware that there was a mission statement to be written generationally, and that that mission statement needed to start with a sense of autonomy and independence for more concern. Thank you both. We've have. A lot of messages from all over the world, actually. We have one from South Africa saying thank you very much. But unfortunately, we are out of time. My great thanks to John and Trevor, who will probably tease me off camera now. My thanks also you to can't Jane. Escape that. <laughs> I've got, I've got a, a moment, I'll get the list out. I'll escape that. <laughs> yeah. um, my thanks also to Jane, Nazadko, Linda Payne, and Malik Harris at the centre. And of course, Asha Tia Confra and David Lawson at Smoking Dogs Films for their help with this presentation. To see John and Trevor's film, Newman, in full in its first worldwide public screening, please see the Centre's online exhibition on our website titled Art in Focus, The Provocation of Conditions, that includes three other short films by Ori Gersht, Liz Rhodes and Margaret Tate. All four films may be viewed exclusively online until August the 23rd. Please join us for our next online artist and conversation program on Friday, July the 16th at 12 p.m. EDT with artist Jan Howarth and Joe Applin, professor in the history of art at the Courtauld Institute. My thanks again to John and Trevor and goodbye. <laughs>